Hey everybody, uh, here's another one of our interviews on um, one of the sub projects on the religion and brain overall project. And today we're talking with um, Wesley Wildman, who is doing um, a project on computational simulations of how supernatural agents are produced in the mind and brain. Um, and so I, th I think this is especially important work. And um, I think it's going to yield unique insights into this stuff. So I'm hoping today uh, Wesley can uh, tell us a bit more about that work and what it promises and what's involved in it and that kind of thing. So again, um, welcome everybody and welcome Wesley. Good to be with you, Patrick. So um, as I was just saying, you are using computational simulation modeling methods to look at this whole area of cognitive science religion and I don't think a, a lot of neuroscientists um, know what is involved in that. I mean, they use certain, some neuroscientists use some computational modeling techniques, um, particularly in neuroeconomics. Um, but it's it's a bit different from the kinds of stuff that you're doing. Is that correct? Do, in, in as far as yeah. you know? Yeah, is you sure. using dynamic systems modeling techniques? Yeah. Maybe it'd be helpful to back up just a little bit and talk about what computational simulation is. Uh, a model is uh, an abstract depiction of some complex object, whatever it is, and there are all kinds of models. One particular kind of model allows for execution over time. <clears throat> some models are static, you just get a, a schematic diagram for example of a building but the sort of models we build are dynamic <clears throat> and that they're supposed to be executed over time so they're well suited to capturing processes in the real world that extend over time now one of the big challenges with these um, models that extend over time is that the complex systems that you can access using that kind of method can involve extreme complexity. They can involve, <coughs> excuse me, they can involve a kind of um, reinforcing effect or a dampening effect or uh, multiple effects that you get based on tiny, tiny changes in inputs, which is what we call sensitive dependence. So all of those features of complex systems come into play when you do time dependent modeling. In order to get control over that, the best way to implement a time dependent model is on a computer if you can, because then you can explore the parameter space that is change the settings and see what the behavior of the model is fairly easily automatically. And you can get a tremendous amount of data very quickly. Now, none of that's gonna help if the model's junk, but if the model's a good model, if you're talking to the right experts and if you've got the right data to calibrate it, then you can actually use the computational system as you execute it over time to study a real world time dependent system, such as a cognitive process in a person's brain or a social process where a whole bunch of people behave with one another in such a way as to cause to emerge Mm -hmm. social features such as for example moral norms or religious convictions or mm -hmm. beliefs about supernatural agents that are widely held in a group now that type of thing is called social simulation when you're trying to use a computational system to do time dependent modeling of a social group and that's important and valuable and we do a lot of that the particular type of modeling we're using in this case is just looking at a single person as soon as you talk to a neuroscientist and they're thinking that you're modeling in a computer, a single person, they're going to be thinking of neural modeling. So that's very low level representation of neurons and synapses to express some type of brain system. 
we're not operating at that level. The neuroscientists are very good at that and they can handle that at their level. We're up above that. We're at the level of cognitive processes, which is to say large scale systems within the brain that interact with one another in complex ways and produce complex forms of behavior. It is possible to push downwards to neural modeling mm -hmm. from the level at which we work. And it's also possible to push upwards to the social outworkings of individuals who have brains of this kind. What we're doing in the project with you guys is just staying in that middle territory mm -hmm. as much as we can and trying to get clear about what's going on in a mind when people come to believe in supernatural agents. I hope that serves as a kind of overall yeah, that, overview. Yeah, that was that was great. Um, and you you and um, some of your colleagues have already done created some computational models or dynamic systems models of religious phenomena. Can you say a little bit about what you've done previously with this stuff? What you found? So that would give us an idea of kind of unique insights people could get from this kind of work. Most of the models we built are about social phenomena of religion. Yeah. We have built some of our minds, but I'll get to them in a second. But minds can be con can be conceived of as a, a group of socially interacting agents. Mm. There are many theories of mind that see it that way. Right. So when when you, if you go to an economist and ask them to set up a model of a society who understand how some complex economic process works, they're going to set up a whole bunch of agents that interact with one another, but those agents are going to be pretty dumb. They're not going to be able to do much. They're just going to be able to make trade-off decisions like, is this worth it to me or is it not worth it to me? They're essentially rational agents who have a rational calculus that they're equipped with. That's right. a very simple and unrealistic type of cognition. In real life, human beings have all sorts of complex motivations. They often act against their best interests and we're not fully rational when we act. Uh, getting those minds into agents so that the agents can interact in this, let's call it a semi-rational way, is quite the art form. It's called agent-based modeling, but with cognitively complex agents. So sometimes mm. it's called multi-agent artificial intelligence because each one of the agents in the artificial society has a bit of sophistication to them in terms of their emotional and cognitive and behavioral processing. Now that's one type of model. I'll give you an example. We used uh, models like that to try and figure out how it is that religious groups can mutually escalate in their religious violence. Um, and wow. uh, <clears throat> using models of that kind, we were able to out predict all other forms of prediction to, uh, to reconstruct processes of violence, for example, in the Gujarat riots in India, or in the troubles in, in Northern Ireland. Wow. So better than regression, for example, uh, several times better than regression. So these, these modeling techniques using semi-rational agents that interact with each other are very powerful. And you can, you can reproduce the real world in a far more fine grained way than is normally possible. And now you run like there's, thousands and millions and millions of tests, basically. In these yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yes, the, some when, when you've got a lot of uh, tuning factors like knobs for these models, and those tuning factors we call parameters. And you're looking for the sort of tuning zone where you've got all the parameters set to produce the really interesting behavior, the behavior that's closest to what you're interested in from a theoretical and practical point of view. Uh, but of course, sometimes you have to dig around to find where that is. So we tend to do very large scale parameter sweeps to start with that cover unrealistic combinations of parameters and then zone, uh, find, the, find the fruitful zone where the really interesting dynamics are happening. And then we go over that with a fine tooth comb. And that's where we wind up getting very detailed information about the dynamics. These are all agent based models. Mm -hmm. with semi-rational agents that have a bit of sophistication to them. The sort of model that um, you were referring to a minute ago is called a system dynamics model. Yeah. They don't have agents. 
Uh -huh. Agents are uh, bottom-up models. Agent-based models, are, you build the agents, they interact with each other, and then you get these emergent features that come out of those interactions and agents. But a system dynamics model is a top-down form of modeling where you picture an entire system. I'll give you an example. Uh, we've built a system to describe the way people decided to leave hunter-gatherer lifestyles and become farmers to settle in townships with working with domesticated crops and domesticated animals and surviving in a completely different way. And our argument is that religion played a critical function in that process based on its ability to create social glue. But we did not model individual agents for that. We hmm. took the whole system and that which we understood fairly well from my work at Chattel Hayek in central southern Turkey, visiting that site uh, for three years in a row to get our heads clear about exactly what's happening. Now, that type of thing doesn't tell you about individual people. It's insensitive to psychological differences, but it can capture level uh, population level data, which is what we've got in situations like that. Now, there's a third type of modeling that also uses this system dynamic approach. Mm -hmm. And that's of the minds that I was speaking about before. And in that case, you, the system you're looking at isn't a social group, it's an individual mind with lots of cognitive, emotional and behavioral elements in it. And you're trying to capture that mind in a model and doing it in such a way that you can tune the parameters of the model to make the model look like different people, different kinds of people, depending on those tuning factors. And that's what we're doing with you. That's, that's amazing. That's fascinating. <laughs> and um, I, my understanding uh, about the transition from hunter-gatherer lifestyles to agriculturally-based townships, you know, uh, the Neolithic transition, let's call it, um, there, some of the archaeological data suggested that religion was important, but it sounds like you're saying none of that was uh, consensus knowledge, but now you're producing these um, simulation models that makes that really increases our confidence that religion was the glue that allowed at least in the in this particular case the trans you know the Neolithic transition. Mm -hmm. Yep. So is it just one more piece of evidence uh, for that hypothesis? Religion was the glue, or or is it? Does it yield like uniquely um, valuable piece of knowledge in that hypothesis that religion was crucial? It's a good question. I'll answer. I think I have to back up just a little and tell you what the consensus is. <laughs> Excuse me. Most people think that changes in civilizational form are driven by guns, germs, steel, energy capture, a whole bunch of things related to economy and violence and territorial ambition. Climate change. Yeah, that's right. So that, those sorts of things, of course, are genuine factors. So yeah. the argument we're trying to make is not that religion is a causal factor that supplants those, but that religion is a necessary causal factor that complements those. And the, the way we make a case like that is to run a model like this with and without religion and see it, see the agricultural transition happen when religion's in the picture and not happen when it's not in the picture. Ah, interesting, yeah. So that, that shows that you can't really, a, sorry to interrupt, Leslie, you can't really do that uh, with the archeological data, I assume. You can't take out religion, you know, and, and, you know, perform the experiment. Whereas you can do that with the computational modeling approach. And you do it ethically too. Yeah, it's a, it's a real problem imagining redoing the world. And it's yeah. even more of a problem if you're dealing with living situations and what you're exploring is a policy shift. It's unethical to impose a, a policy just on an experimental whim to see if it's going to make things better or not. And people could die based on that. Mm. So there's a serious ethical problem associated with experimentation with large systems and thus being able to use computational models 
not only allows you to explore historical what ifs, but it allows you to handle contemporary situations in a more ethical way. And so we just think for a second, we, we do that with everything. We build an aircraft wing in a computer simulation long before we ever spend money building the wing or putting a person in a plane. And we do the same thing with bridges and with distribution networks and computer systems. We, we simulate everything because we can explore the behavior of the system under strange circumstances, as well as predictable circumstances. You can check out its behavior when there's a huge storm or whatever, if it's a bridge you're talking about and so on. So we should be doing the same thing when we build policy and we should be able to do the same thing even when we study history. I would think so, yeah for both ethical and scientific reasons. Exactly. <clears throat> Excuse me. Gives you much, much more power and, uh, and allows you to explore things that would be otherwise impossible mm. in very disciplined, constrained, quantitative ways. Now, the way you're gonna trust a model to help you explore possibilities like that is if you validated it first. So what you want the model to do is to produce one situation that you really know about get it get it to behave in the way the real world does and then you've got confidence in the internal causal architecture of the model and that confidence is exactly what you need to extend the model into new situations to try out a new policy or to do a what if scenario analysis uh, with regard to the neolithic whatever it is but you've got to validate those models first otherwise it's a kind of a it's just a, a sort of a I don't know, speculative exploration, which can be useful for theoretical purposes, but it doesn't tell you as much as you would really want about how the world works. And to validate the model, um, you need to already know how a phenomena operates in the real world. And then um, you, you take the, the key parameters from, from that, you and place it into the model, and if the model behaves that way, then you know you got a valid model, and then you can start the experiments. Is that right. about? Right? That's about right. Yeah. There's a <clears throat> there's a few. Sorry, there are a few subtleties there. Um, for for one thing, you can get a model correct by accident. Hmm. So you you really want to check out not just one situation, but varieties of the situation to make sure that the model can adapt and express different versions of a situation. So if you've got a model that expresses a mind, for example, you'd want it to work for different kinds of people that you've got good data on. That's one subtlety. Another one is that quite often we don't have all the data we want. The model expresses a complex theory, which you get from an expert like you about the way the brain works. But it turns out that you don't have data to validate every part of that theory because the theory is grounded in data but stretches into new territory. So sure. in those cases, you can partially validate a model and then you can create parameters that express where you've got question marks. Mm -hmm. And then tune those parameters against the real world situation. So let's say you don't have information on uh, a particular amount of sleep that someone needs to have to be in real trouble for health. You don't know that number. It might be four hours, it might be two hours a night, whatever. You just don't know. That's because maybe no one studied that. And so just no one knows. But it's a critical part of the model. So you, you build the model in every other respect so that it matches reality and then allow the model to run over that particular question about how much sleep is dangerously low. And you are gonna get a model, a number from the model that tells you what that number should be. And that becomes a prediction wow. that someone yeah. can test with a real world experiment. That's another type of subtlety in the validation process. These are very data hungry things, these models. And I, I would think that would be particularly powerful if the model produces um, outputs that can be then tested in the real world, see if the numbers are the same. That's amazing. Yeah, we call it in the philosophy of science, uh, that's often called uh, producing novel facts. So if, if you've got a theoretical methodological procedure that generates novel information that you didn't know before, it's a sign of a progressive research program. And we, we routinely have such signs around efforts in computational modeling. It's a very powerful method. And uh, as a result, uh, 
one of the problems that happens is that people can rely on it too much. For example, in the medical care field, if you produce a, a population health model that say talks about one of the things we study is rural suicide that, that may give you an understanding of how to reduce rural suicide rates. Mm. People could just rely on that 100% without really understanding the limitations of the model. And that's a serious problem because, of course, you're talking about lives here. This is, yeah. becomes a life and death issue. So it's uh, the same thing's true in the military where computational simulations are used routinely. You have to be very critical about them to look for the defects or the problems, or the hidden assumptions, because people's lives could be at stake. Um, computational systems that are very useful can be dangerous by making us careless, just accepting that it's working when it might actually be misfiring in some way. That seems to me a really important caveat. Um, what, so um, it seems to me um, that what you're talking about here and what you and your team have been developing is incredibly valuable set of tools that the whole field of religion and brain research or the cognitive science of religion or in general, the, scientific study of religion could really use and benefit from but i don't see it being widely used or adopted there's probably high barriers to entry maybe but maybe not can can you speak to that issue of yeah. that's a really good question someone like me who works across computational data sciences and uh, academic study of religion uh, often feels frustrated by the the gaps but, Academic study of religion is largely a humanities field. That is, there's historians and literary people, I mean, these people are extremely good at what they do. But they only produce half the literature every year. The other half of the literature comes from people using scientific methods, from you know, neuroimaging studies to psychological studies to social survey studies, the sorts of things we do. Now, that's, uh, that's a lot of literature. And the, the problem is that that literature is more or less inaccessible to the real experts in religion. So where is it coming from? Almost all of it's coming from other departments in the university who recognize that religion's important, but who aren't experts in studying religion. So there's a, this, this chasm causes a terrible problem. The scientists who are producing all of this work don't benefit from the deepest knowledge about religion that the humanities people have. And the humanities people have uh, experience a very high barrier to entry to even read those articles, let alone find people to participate in research studies with. Uh, our experience from the beginning, we've been doing this for a long time now, has been to try and get people from both sides working together on projects. And we found that to be incredibly effective. Every single humanities person who's worked with us on a, with a team of engineers and psychologists and sociologists and neuroscientists and whatnot, they all say that it's a transformative moment for them. Mm. They experience themselves as having skills that are necessary in the process, in particular, their hermeneutical skills, their sensitivity to ambiguity, their ability to analyze concepts. They operate an extremely high level compared to most scientists in those regards, especially when you're dealing with slippery territory like religion and behavior and feelings and so on. And that they've also, uh, experience themselves as understanding their own religion theories better after participating in a process like that mm. than they did before because of the precision required to express such a theory inside a computational system which is hostile to ambiguity so if there is yeah. any ambiguity at all residual yeah. or otherwise that process is going to flush it out into the open and give the humanities scholar a chance to clarify and that's how they come away from it understanding things better now this has been such a consistent pattern that it's very disappointing for me to see how few people experience it mm. and it's a transformative genuinely transformative moment in people's careers and yet it's so rare people are content with their own approaches and well, do the scientists get transformed as well as the humanities? Yeah. I'll give you an example. We had uh, engineers uh, 
working for us for several years on teams building computational simulations of the sort we've been talking about. Normally they're doing something for the military or they're analysing traffic flow or something like this. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting for them to work on this kind of issue. They come away from it feeling as though they're finally doing something with their skill set that's meaningful, that yeah. actually matters in human life. And they feel so excited about that. Yeah. They would much prefer to be doing that than figuring out what's the best way to line up traffic or what's set yeah. timing on traffic lights or whatever. But it's very beautiful to see the two-way elimination that occurs in this process. Yeah. And it's such a tragic, tragic waste that so little of this is occurring. But how does computational modeling fit into this um, problem of um, uh, the scientists who study religion often work with very paper thin ideas about religiosity in the humanity scholars who know all the nuances about quote unquote religion. You know, there's high barriers of entry into the scientific study of religion for them. Um, where does computational modeling fit in the universe of um, getting those two groups to talk and, you know, work together and produce some revolutionary insights? Yes, that particular method, computational modeling and simulation, is very useful for achieving that goal, this two-way communication. The reason for that is that it's virtually impossible to do one by yourself. You absolutely need to be working on a team. And because there are a few people, even people like me, who are capable of building a simulation and also doing the theory of it. But there are so many different angles and technical things you might explore. It'd be very easy for run for me to run into my limits when I'm using that. So even for someone like me, it's better to work on a team. In fact, for other people who don't have that that dual skill set, it's essential to work on a team. So right from the start. If you're smart about how you build those teams, you've got all of those people in the room already invested in what's going on and getting to know each other and adapting to the way each other thinks and their pace of thought and their depth of thought and the way they reason about things. So all of these things, it's like, it's like learning to live in a new culture for both sides. And really there's more than two sides, the computational engineers, and the humanities people are usually in the room with social scientists. And that's another whole culture difference. So putting all of those people together and getting them to work on something because they care about it, because it's important to them, is wonderful for everyone. And this is the perfect method for getting everyone together. And just think about the other methods that you can do. Uh, think about surveys. I run surveys as well. I, I don't need to talk to such a diverse group of people to run a yeah. survey, analyze a survey and produce a, uh, produce a paper or an experiment, a psychological experiment, same thing. You, a little bit of cross-discipline work is great, but it's not totally necessary, but right. in computational simulation, it's absolutely critical. So it's the ideal method for getting people together across the boundaries of university disciplines. Hmm. Um, let's get into a bit now a, a, a little bit more technical detail. If uh, a neuroscientist who's interested in religion wanted to incorporate um, these kinds of high level computational models, like, you know, like the time sensitive dynamic systems approach, what software would you recommend or what skills would they need to start to brush up on and is there anyone besides yourself that they could contact and start developing collaborations or, you know, how would, how would a neuro, now we're talking to the neuroscientists interested yeah. in religion. What would you recommend to them to, you know, to take up, I mean, cause these are really powerful tools. Yeah, they are. And the neuroscientists would have no reason to know about them unless they come yeah. across them like you can tell them about them. I don't know about neural modeling tools and software for that, but they won't know about this stuff. Yeah, normally. So one, one thing, if you don't mind me saying, is to do what you did, which is to actually go and get a degree in religion after you've got your PhD in neuroscience and, and uh, force yourself <clears throat> to absorb the religious perspective in the way that experts do. And that's a, that's, a, that's a very sort of aggressive, large-scale move, and you have to be very dedicated to do that. And probably that's... Uh, 
that's beyond reach for a lot of neuroscientists. So practically speaking, the way to, the way to go, almost all neuro, neuroscientists know how to write code. Mm -hmm. But there are methods these days that allow you to, <laughs> excuse me, that allow you to produce computational simulations without having to write code. And you can save the code writing <coughs> for um, doing little fine tuned things. You can actually produce a working simulation without that. So where would you go? Uh, the first place to go would be any logic, I think. A-N-Y-L-O-G-I-C. Any logic is a, a, a company that produces multimodal simulation software and they have a free version of it that's very sophisticated and you can build almost mm -hmm. anything you want in that free version there's a bunch of things you can't do in the free version that you would care about if you wanted to do big parameter sweeps or something but the free version you can do a lot and you can learn a lot as well and in particular there's a, a course that they offer free course called any logic in three days and in those three days you concentrate on three different types of modeling, the agent-based modeling that I mentioned before and the system dynamics modeling that you and I have been talking about, but also another kind like discrete event simulation, which we use when the particular system in question is like an assembly line in a factory or something with discrete events occurring. So that, that's a very, very good way to get in. Hmm. If you're comfortable with coding, then you can learn a new language and get into a different type of modeling that's available in several different types of software. Net Logo, N E T L O G O, is uh, free software with a very sophisticated programming language, but it's really only very good for agent based modeling. Mm. If you want to do system dynamics modeling in the way we were talking about that before, there aren't really good free options aside from any logic um, that I would be comfortable recommending. You, you depend a lot on the, the simulation engine that's mm. sort of hidden from view. And yeah. the best of those are hard to build and they're very technical things. So you really want to have a good simulation engine. You've got one in any logic. And the other way to get good engines of that kind, you really have to pay for the software. Would any logic? Point, um, be able to run on any laptop or you know, yes. supercomputer? Or? Yes, the, the personal learning edition of any logic will run on your laptop. It, it's not demanding at all unless you give it a massive parameter sweep and then, of course, it could take oh, days yeah. to run. Yeah. Now that's, but that's up to you, how you investigate yeah. it. Um, of course, the, the dangers um, of doing that, if a neuroscientist interested in religion you know started using any logic the dangers of course would be to you can produce anything you want to produce if you don't you know bring in the the constraints from what we know about how things operate in the real world and the other constraint of having to work with somebody who knows something about religious phenomena you need to bring in that team to do it right in other words i think so Otherwise, it's just a speculative exercise. I agree, and the speculative exercise is going to be very good for learning. But if you want to do something serious, you need to be dealing with the best people. And that means expert level teams, uh, it means engineers that probably possess capabilities that you don't. But it's there's still a very important role for the person, for a person in that process. It's a little bit like conducting an orchestra. And I quite often do that, uh, conduct the orchestra, which is to say, uh, elicit the information needed from the subject matter experts, guide the engineers as they build to make sure that they're working on the right things in the right order, uh, resolve issues of ambiguity, try and crystallize achievements when we get to them and so on. That's a very important role too. And very often the catalyzer of a project, if they've got the right skill set, can be a very good conductor, especially if they know a little bit what every, about what everyone in the room is doing. But that helps a lot. So there's a lot of roles, including that conducting role, and probably a neuroscientist who knows a bit about religion and knows a bit about simulation could wind up in that role. That'd be assembling that team. Hmm. Okay, um, let's talk a little bit about the particular uh, model you're developing now for generation of supernatural agent cognitions. 
can you um, tell the audience just a little bit about that? And well, I can. Yeah, you're not going to like this answer, Patrick, but but hold on to your seat. Uh, the uh, the particular model in question, like most models, uses a particular subject matter expert and extracts from that expert the insights that are necessary to implement into the model. So the real person you need to talk to would be the subject matter expert on our team, because that's the person whose mind we're essentially juicing yeah. to get the information we need to put into that minute there. And I, I, I'm just having trouble remembering who the subject matter expert <laughs> That team is, do you, do you recall, Patrick? That would be me in this oh, case. You. <laughs> it's you, of course, it's you. Yeah, so. But, but I, just, I, just wanted the, I just wanted the audience to, to just have some inkling of, you know, like what the hypothesis is in this, in this particular model that you're developing now. You know, because it's just one particular hypothesis about how one system contributes to the, um over time development of supernatural agent cognitions in the brain in a particular part of the brain so maybe we can do this together since it's very often. i can't i can barely hear you suddenly leslie oh i'm sorry are we better yeah that's what yeah when you're turned that way it's... okay so then uh, maybe we could do this together because sure, the, yeah, yeah. The, the main the central theory uh it is critically associated with your own thinking about this. So let's just uh, back up one step and notice that um, <clears throat> um, a large hypothesis has a social aspect and it has a neural aspect. So let's be clear about that. The model we're working on is of the neural aspect, but it's we believe on our team that it, the social aspect is equally important. Yeah. What do we mean by that? If someone has a dream and they come to believe that it supports uh, supernatural belief, that's almost always going to be because there's a group that ramifies that yes. belief or a group that suggests that belief in the first place. Yes. So the social context Cycle. is critical for understanding yes. how it is that people become confident. I, I've spoken to quite a few people who've had supernatural agent dreams who don't take them seriously. Yeah. But if someone has a supernatural agent dream and it seems to resonate with something in the group that they belong to, then they can very easily feel as though they're actually generating evidence from their own experience that confirms there you go. The group endorsed belief. So that's yeah. the group level process. Mm -hmm. right, now, we're particularly interested in the model that we're working on with you at that lower level about how that works in the mind. Yeah. And the critical claim that we're making is that dreaming can contribute to the formation of beliefs that you're willing to take for a spin in the social world. You're yeah. willing to relate to something that's already believed, or you're willing to raise questions about your social group, bringing something new to them, saying, I had this experience, I think it's real, let's talk about it. So what would cause someone to be so confident that they would be willing to take a social risk like that, mm. what, what, what would cause them to be really confident? And it's got to be a pretty powerful dream experience, we think. We mm -hmm. believe. So mm -hmm. What we're trying to do in this model is to describe how a powerful dream experience of that kind could arise. And in such a way that someone doesn't just, just put it aside and uh, say that's not important, but they, they actually want to take it seriously. I think that that's a great um, explanation, and I think that's certainly um, a, a reasonable, rational hypothesis for um, one source of why people take some supernatural agent beliefs seriously. You know, like a supernatural agent may appear in a dream, it's very memorable, and it resonates with the um, extant cultural mythology in some way that the two reinforce each other and and then affects ongoing behavior but another part an equally important part of the hypothesis in my opinion and and a part that makes the REM sleep and dreaming system particularly important is um if it the it, the hypothesis that that system produces the cognitive materials 
that then allows one to cognize what the culture calls supernatural images, beliefs, that kind of stuff. So there are certain, you know, like the, the old anthropologists used to talk about counterintuitive concepts, for example, as cognitive materials that um, allows you to remember certain things versus other, you know. So it's that it's that level of you know we're we're hypothesizing about that unconscious level of mental processing that produces the cognitive materials that then allows cognitions of quote unquote supernatural agents in the rim and dreaming system. It, is ideal in many ways doing that. And, you know, there's empirical evidence that it does it on a daily basis, you know? So, um, but having a computational model that can disprove certain aspects of, of that and point to more reliable aspects of that um, hypothesized process seems to me to be incredibly uh, valuable. So a couple of aspects of that, that I want to comment on. The first is that uh, the, one of the central theses that we're exploring that comes directly from you is the, the idea that the characteristics of the images that show up in dreams are very important for understanding their effects. And it's possible for images to be, to make you sad or happy or frightened, or there's a lot of different negative and positive things that can happen. They can be varying degrees of intensity, but it particularly important we think is the fact that those images can be so overpowering that it feels as though they just grasp and dominate your imagination. And they are so powerful in that sense that they're not only memorable, but they seem to require an explanation. Yes. That, that, that makes a very fruitful element to go into a supernatural agent cognition. So that's one uh, one point that's a very important part of this model. And another thing has to do with the way the elements of imagery come together in the first place. Mm. In an earlier project we did with you, we created a dreaming model in which we, we implemented uh, another group's theory about how our dreaming is supposed to work. And uh, the, the critical process in that so-called Levin-Nielsen theory is the disassembly of memories, sometimes painful experience memories, yeah. into little fragments or little image pieces. And those image pieces, having been disassembled, get reassembled in a variety of ways, combined with reasonably harmless things, uh, combined sometimes in extremely potent ways that show up in our dreaming, which is why dreams are so amusing and, uh, and sometimes scary and but that recombination it seems to be the ground of a tremendous amount of creativity in humans. Yes. It's why dreams have been so inspirational in so many cultures. But this recombination process of image components, it also gives rise to supernatural agent cognitions that yes. can be relatively coherent. Um, not, not exactly like a human being, but maybe like a human being with a few twists that make it interesting and memorable and better suited to storytelling. And so the creative process in general uh, that happens through the dreaming process in the Levin-Nielsen model also lies behind, we think, the construction of compelling supernatural agents. Would you want to comment on those two things? No, I mean, that's, that's really well put. I couldn't have said it better. And I think one last thing to say about this before, because I'm looking at the time, is um, in the process of producing this model of how this particular brain system contributes to supernatural agent cognitions, you and your team have also produced the first validly tested computational model of dreaming itself. Yes. <laughs> you guys should, I mean, hats off to you for, for doing that. that. That's that in itself is an accomplishment. And I think the um, sleep medicine community and the dream science community is starting to wake up to that fact as well. So that's just, but before, before we end our conversation today, I wanted to switch gears a little bit and um, 
ask you a, a much more broad question because you're kind of a unique person in many uh, ways that you're one of the founders of Religion, Brain, and Behavior, which is uh, one of the key journals in the neuroscience of religion, cognitive science of religion, evolutionary approaches to religion. I mean, all the cutting edge scientific work on religion. And I know our viewers and listeners would be really interested in hearing your take. And I know this is a very broad question. Hearing your take on uh, where the whole um, scientific study of religion sort of is currently. What are some of the emerging trends? Maybe AI, I don't know. What are some of the emerging trends that you think are significant or going to be significant um where are we stuck you know also as scientists interested in religion you know you're, you 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 see a lot of papers submitted to religion brain and behavior from the best scientists in the world and you know you have a unique perspective yeah well there are six editors now uh, on uh, religion brain and behavior so a lot going on there and yeah. it has become the uh, number two religion journal in site source out of 600 religion journals. So, yeah, wow. it's, 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 grown, it's grown uh, uh, quickly. And that's partly because people want a really serious venue for talking yeah. about scientific studies. And there's a lot of scientific studies that are not that great. And yeah. so we do a lot of desk rejects, but uh, the good ones come through and they enable us to have a conversation that does arc across the various disciplines that are involved. So uh, one of the things we do in uh, the Centre for Mind and Culture, which is uh, the research centre that I run, as you know, is um, analyses of entire bodies of literature. Uh, we call it field mapping, and we use computational methods to do that to do network analytics, to see development over time and so forth. So when we do that, um, we can compare it to what we see in the journal and we mm -hmm. can compare it to what we see um, in the IBCSR research review that we put out yeah. every month. Which is fantastic. That, 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 that to all neuroscientists interested in religion. So that gives us leading edge information about what yeah. happens month by month by month in the whole literature. So, yeah. And in this, using these three sources of information, we can learn a few things about the field as a whole. And we can also see some areas where things get a bit stuck. So I would say uh, the big lesson to learn, which probably surprises most people, is that the large majority of publications comes out from medicine and public health. It's in spirituality, medicine, and health. There are very clear yeah. signals that that religiosity, spirituality, meditation, things like that, the social support associated with groups that are religious, yeah. that those those uh, effects on health, mental and physical health, um, are on the whole positive. You can have unwanted stress, and various horrible things can happen to you in those groups. So that's true too. But on the whole, uh, it's a healthful positive it's up obviously the medical profession is going to care about that and there's a formidable amount of yeah, there's a ton of that now. Studies. that's by far and away the largest chunk now if we pull away from that and look at the scientific study of religion more narrowly so now we're talking sociology psychology neuroscience evolutionary theory biology of evolution and so forth then you've got a very different story it's a much smaller um a set of clusters of research, and it's much, much newer. It really only sprang up since 1990, and it's accelerated rapidly since then. The antecedents of that stuff are in the humanities, not in the sciences. Mm. So they're in the, the humanistic thinkers who did cross-cultural anthropology, but also kept in mind that people have bodies and mm -hmm. paid attention to minds and bodies as they did their work. So as a result, you've got antecedents, but no real scientific achievements in the hard sciences until you get past 1990. So most of it's not since uh, it, in that first decade, it's light and it gets heavier after that increasingly from 2000 onwards. We really talk about only the last quarter century and less than that, really. So mm -hmm. it's very new. 
it's very untested in a certain way. And that means that people are experimenting with methods. So this brings us to the first sort of stuck point. Sometimes people get stuck using older methods that are really out of date, considering yep. the interdisciplinary complexity that we know is needed to handle religious phenomena. Yeah. That's sort of said. So you see a, a psychologist of religion is used to doing a cross-sectional survey, gives you no basis for causal inference whatsoever, and it probably can't even be replicated. So why on earth would we want to publish such a thing? There are lots of studies like that that will be published in a psychology of religion journal, <clears throat> but because the weak causal inference is present, there, or no, no causal inference at all, it's just purely cross-sectional, then the, basically we don't think we're learning anything. Yeah. And because of the replication crisis in the social sciences, there's a real problem with publishing things from which we're not going to learn anything. Yeah. So we're much more interested yeah. in... Uh, things where there is causal inference, for example, longitudinal studies yep. or cross-sectional studies that are done well enough with very sophisticated cross-checks, especially with qualitative discussions with participants about what mattered to them or what they felt changed what. That can be good. Um, and um, experimental studies, oh, longitudinal studies, uh, those sorts of things that I just mentioned are three. And then the fourth one, would be computational modeling. In mm -hmm. computational modeling, of course, you're using a causal system to model a causal system. So sure. it gives you far stronger bases for causal yeah. inference than you can get from regression models or correlation studies or various other cross-sectional designs. So that's one dead end. The other dead end, we already talked about it, so I don't need to stress it so much, but it's this separation yeah. between humanities approaches to religion and scientific approaches to religion, the tragic separation that leads to the, the implementation of superficial or paper thin interpretations of religion on the science side and on the humanities side leads to obliviousness to the leading edge results that are coming out of the sciences that should be incorporated into humanistic theorizing about religion. And that's the second thing, when you, when you actually look at the network, of mm -hmm. food sighting, you see this horribly expressed with zero, almost zero connection between the humanities and the scientific side of the literature. Yeah. It's miserable to look at. You know it's happening in real life, of course, so it's not a surprise, but when right. you see it in the field mapping, it's just so sad and it's so unnecessary that yeah. that, that, that might help uh, to yes, for sure. in that direction. If I look at... Um, Aside from the, as you, you know, pointed out, the religion and health um, effect, that I think has been established and now people are looking at ways in which religion might actually harm health in some respects in some populations. So, so aside from that, and when you're looking at evolutionary, cognitive, psychology, and neuro um, approaches to religion, when I, take stock of what's been accomplished in the last 25 years. See if you agree with any of this. So for the neuroscience, I would say, well, some of the stuff that I would find reliable or when we ask people to do uh, religious tasks, they tend to use the same neural networks when they uh, do theory of mind tasks or social cognition tasks. So that's kind of a that's kind of interesting. It's a little bit trivial, but you know, it's it's relatively reliable for at least for many religious tasks. But beyond that, I don't think we've accomplished much yet in the neuro approaches to religion with regard to evolutionary approaches to religion. There have been several interesting hypotheses. All of them have some empirical support. Everything from you know the costly signaling approach to um, religion's role in promoting certain forms of cooperation due to uh, punishment and other uh, methods, supernatural punishment and other methods. And um, again, at least some hypotheses have been articulated and received empirical support, but I. I don't see any consensus or, you know, that there's still like this array of hypotheses with no consensus emerging from the evolutionary with regard to 
cognitive science approaches, same same deal, you know, like um, um, theory of mind again is once once again in, in important, mentalizing these kinds of um, ideas. But a lot of the cognitive science approaches, I, I think some of the work on ritual has been um, validated and now it's kind of reliable, but um, but even there, I feel like we're stuck in the, you know, there's not been new innovations and in CSR approaches as far as I can, maybe I'm missing. I mean, so those are some, that's a really pessimistic take on those for um, scientific approaches to religion, religion. What do you think? Yeah, that's that's uh, interesting. I essentially agree with that. There's a, a complicated set of caveats I'd add if we had another hour, so I won't do that. But um, important to notice, I think, is that there's a, um, a lot of that is to be expected because the field is so young. So there's a, a lot of exploratory moves being made. Yeah. Uh, there hasn't been much time for solid replications. Yeah. And sometimes we see nice replications and we grow in confidence about something, but mm -hmm. as often we know that people have got desk drawer results that they don't think they can publish because they're essentially failed hypotheses, yeah. which often enough are also failed replications. So yeah, well, this, is a, this is a complicated territory and how to make progress in it is is quite complicated in the area of neuroscience for example way back when there was a study on glossolalia or speaking in tongues mm -hmm. and that was an interesting study that that showed essentially that the linguistic areas of the brain weren't involved in glossolalia very important result um, however it was done on i forget three people maybe yeah it was a very small number and so it's very difficult I and mean, it's too expensive and just look at the number of people who are paid to do the neuroscience of religion as far as i know in the world that is one person who's paid full time to do that Ufi Schert and yeah. Denny, yeah. the university of Aarhus, and uh, everyone else is doing it on the side like you exactly. and other yeah. neuroscientists i know they're doing they're expert in something and the, that's where the money comes from and they, that's how i did it for decades yeah. yeah and you're not alone uh, it's it's almost everyone is like that the fact that there happens to be a request for proposals related to this is super encouraging, but of course, it's not going to change the fundamental nature of the field in that there's so much for neuroscience to study and religion just tends to be sidelined in the process. And, and when people do study it, they do their best, but the methods aren't really up to snuff. Like what neuroscientist would accept a result with tiny n? Uh, yeah. the, the, they wouldn't, right? They just would, they couldn't. You'd need, you need many, many more people than that. Yeah. So these are something like suggestive pilot level type studies, and it's difficult to make progress when there's not enough money to do anything different than that. Yeah. Something similar can be said for other domains as well, including evolutionary and cognitive science. Mm -hmm. uh, the, best, the best advances have been made where there really has been funding on large database projects. So this, I would say, mm -hmm. is cultural anthropology applied to yes. religion. That's a good point. Really, really good um, uh, data assemblages built. Uh, Polluter, uh, uh, yes. New Zealand folk for the Pacific Islands, incredibly good for doing uh, phylogenetic analyses, given right. the way those cultures relate to one another. And there's there's a whole bunch of large database projects. Yes, yes. So <clears throat> I'd, I'd say that's a win. Uh, I think you're right that on ritual theory, we've really come somewhere with uh, more uh, evolutionarily and culturally and neurologically specified versions of what's going on in ritual than we had when we yeah. were dependent on the speculations of the early religion anthropologists. Yeah. I think there's some, some gains there. There's a lot of individual differences in religion that we're still not coming to grips with. When we do large scale population studies and think we learn something about religion, the causal inference there is is weak to begin with and threatened by the fact that the variance is large. There's so many different kinds of people sure. who react to religious settings so in so very many different ways. And not being able to take account of those differences is harming our ability to get satisfying theories. 
uh, you're forced to a level of interdisciplinarity that's really unusually intense to deal with something like religion. There's been some great advances with regard to the neuroscience of mystical states coming out of the psychedelic literature, which is really encouraging and promising. However, they, as of yet, haven't incorporated um, sophisticated accounts of religiosity or mysticism. But I mean, you, I mean, uh, they, at least they've they've um, started somewhere and made some real progress on brain contributions to mystical states. Yeah, meditation as well. So that, that in the neuroscience, where, where there's private funding, it's been especially in that area in um, meditation and not religion so much, especially in terms of religious beliefs or religious practices, but meditation and its health effects mentally and physically, uh, uh, that's gotten a lot of study. But um, the, the real theoretical breakthroughs call for exactly what you're talking about. They call for an integration of what we know about the brain from the various bits where it has been studied well, with what we know about religion from the people who study religion. And yeah. uh, this, is, this is where we really struggle. You've been working on that for a long time and more power to you. And hopefully this RFP produces some really good studies in that direction. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say a final word about the RFP, the overall project. Um, uh, we're, we're trying to address all the issues you just so eloquently laid out there um, by um, encouraging in funding a bunch of projects that are focused on how cognitive uh, systems and brain systems um, facilitate cognitions of supernatural agents. So all the projects are focused on that one large issue. So the overall ends are gonna be large. Uh, they're all gonna be using very advanced techniques a variety of techniques from a variety of labs with a variety of participant populations, all on that one question. So that hopefully there'll be some breakthroughs there. Anyway, we've run over our time, but uh, it was a fascinating conversation, Wesley. Thanks for your time, your insights and your work. And um, that's it, thanks a million. It's been a pleasure to be with you, Patrick, and uh, more power to you and to uh, the people like you, including the crew watching this. I hope they're inspired to follow in your footsteps. Thanks a lot, Wesley.